Hi, I'm Brett Brenner with the Electrical Safety Foundation International. Uh, we're here with you today uh, to talk about an important safety device called surge protective devices or SPDs. Um, one of the things we really wanted to discuss with you is, is some misnomers about uh, surge protection devices and to really kind of get uh, the audience up to speed on what they are, how they work, um, and what you should consider when installing them. Uh, in terms of like what we're trying to do in terms of safety, uh, it, it really is vital uh, that we have new technology coming into the market that we're really trying to roll out uh, new devices uh, not only to keep people safe but then also to keep our equipment running to not also put people in harm's way. So with that uh, we've teamed with the NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturing Association's uh, surge protection uh, device section and we wanted to bring you some important information about what an SPD is um, and how it can affect you and your business um, and even you at home. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike and Matt. Uh, they'll briefly introduce themselves to you. Um, and what we'll do is we'll get into it, tell you what a surge is, uh, walk through some of the findings that we had recently had a survey on, uh, and then we can go from there. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Mike, you first, and then Matt, you can follow up. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, <clears throat> Mike Ventola um, with Space Age Electronics. I'm the business development manager here in the southeast region. Um, I have a background in electronic engineering, so you know, being in the life safety industry for three and a half decades now, um, you know, I've used that education to really understand these life safety systems um, from a you know a, an electronic standpoint, which is going to help us today in our conversations. So um, you know, I, I sit on NFPA 92 for smoke control. I'm also a certified fire protection specialist. Um, so over that time, I've been able to use a lot of this, uh, you know, education I had from my youth into today's uh, environment and complicated systems. And we'll be talking about those systems and how surge protection helps those uh, protect those systems. And Matt, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Matt Wakem. I'm with uh, Merson. I'm an SPD consultant with Merson. It's been in the electrical industry for about over 35 years and started my career at Underwriters Laboratories as a project engineer, actually working on surge protective devices, the first two editions of the uh, safety standard, UL1449. Since then, I've worked uh, for several companies, engaged in um, product development, um, business development, and application engineering. Uh, I'm a senior member of IEEE, and uh, contribute to several working groups and chair the Smart Grid uh, Surge Protection Working Group. Also uh, engaged with ULSTPs, IEC, and NEMA. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about something near and dear to my heart, surge protective devices. Yeah, so a lot of times we have um, behind the scenes, uh, we don't necessarily always appreciate what goes into making a code and standard. And I think, you know, talking to you all, we get an opportunity to really kind of break things down. Uh, stay away from the technical, that's something we want to get into, is, is not less the technical, but more of the context and English of why we, we've got these devices in our lives. So with that, I think it's important that we kind of define what a surge is. So um, I know that we've got some uh, slides that we'll be pulling up uh, as well as our, uh, uh, you know, our talking points and things like that. But if you all can kind of tell us uh, from your vantage point what a surge is and kind of walk us through the different um, stories that you have that might be able to put some context around what a surge, right. surge is. Right. So, um, you know, simplest of terms, uh, surge being defined as a very high amplitude voltage or current over a very short period of time. So we're talking microseconds. And this is typically occurring on the voltage lines that are bringing the power to the equipment. So it could be the 120 volt power uh, feed to um, an outlet in a house, or it could be DC circuits, say in a control system. Um, you know, today, look, we live in a solid state world. Everything is silicon based chips, microprocessors, and so forth. And these devices um, can get damaged uh, very easily so, from these surges and the transients. And these happen, they happen every, every, all day. They're happening right now with, with the equipment in this room. Mm -hmm. um, so, trying to protect these uh, sensitive devices from these surges that occur. Um, you know, it is something that's it's not only code required, it's also, you know, 
uh, needed, uh, both uh, both in um, instances where code isn't directing you to do that. I had a had a situation uh, many years ago where I was working on a system in California, and it was a fire alarm system, my background, and the microprocessor kept resetting every time the system went into alarm. So it was like, why is this system resetting, resetting? So we come to find, after doing some diagnostic research, we come to find that a relay that was used during the alarm condition was turning off. And, and for those of you that might know how a relay work, basically you put a voltage on the winding, the coil, and it pulls in the relay, and it's just a switch on the other side, it turns on or off. Well, when that relay was turned off, it created a transient, a a, a, a counter EMF spike because of the, of the turn off voltage back into the wiring which glitched the microprocessor which reset the micro. We fixed that, you know, the problem was away, went away. So very small, right, this was an innocuous voltage kicking back into the micro, but to the point, and on the, on the slide you see there, that uh, phantom equipment restarts. I mean, this is, these are the kind of things that could happen with transients, and this is a simple example. And I think, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, residential systems, as well, applications and systems, as well as commercial industrial. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, many times we just take it for granted. And I think, you know, the smarter and smarter things get in our homes and in our, our workplace, mm -hmm. it also opens up the opportunity for things to start to fail. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, expectations aren't necessarily meeting uh, up with reality in terms of, the, of how much these smart devices have infiltrated almost everything in our homes and in our, in our, our businesses. Um, and so it's like, can you, can you tell us a little bit more from your, your standpoint at, um, you know, kind of things that you've seen in terms of, you know, resetting motors and those kind of things or some residential stories that you might have? Yeah, well, we see surge protection uh, as a part of uh, a, a, an overall power quality um, anomalies that occur every day. Uh, whether it's in a residential, commercial, or industrial environment. And um, we've seen um, where systems in, in an office building uh, where there's no prevalence of lightning occurrences, uh, it's not down in Tampa, Florida, it's uh, an area where they feel that, okay, we really don't have any, any surges because we don't get lightning. Well, the vast majority of surges actually occur within the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we, we go in and we try to have a first line of defense at the service entrance of that facility, but within that facility, because there's motors switching on and off constantly during the course of the day, um, their equipment goes down unexplainably why. And when we go in and do some type of power monitoring, we can easily identify by timestamps that you've got the same equipment cycling on and off, on and off every day there. But also, externally, it's not just lightning. The power utility may have capacitor switching banks to turn on and off, and, and that's coming in to the facility. So there's not one solution that fits all. Just because you put something up front at the entrance of the home or the building, mm -hmm. that's not going to take care of all of the, uh, the occurrences going on inside of the building. So we see that happen quite a bit where there's a misconception that w one, one device is going to take care of the entire facility. There's, there's things to address within and external to that facility to take care of those problems. Sure, and I think you know, education is, is really key to a lot of this, and that's really what the purpose of this, you know, this webinar is. Um, you, you know, we, on the screen on the slides that you'll see, um, you know, we talk about different things that could, could be affected, um, but uh, again, these are costly, these are costly things um, and, and cause downtime, but we also are looking at the human factor of maybe keeping people out of harm's way. So if you don't have people resetting things that could, you know, put them in harm's way, or you don't have uh, people that aren't necessarily skilled enough to, to figure out and troubleshoot things at the same time, you can really can, kind of keep, uh, you know, people safe at the same time. Um, <clears throat> on the screen you'll see some of the uh, surge sources uh, that I think are, are some things that people um, you know just take for granted we talked about lightning on um, the grid but it, it, it's 60 to 80 percent of the time it's actually within the the domicile whether it's commercial industrial or at the home where you have things like HVAC uh, lighting kicking on you name it um, all those things are going to cause cause surges big or small they all do add up after a while and I think a lot of people just don't realize it and why would you um, you know, you might see something like lights dimming in your house that might be a sign of a surge, but other times you're not going to pick it up at all. So it's just something to, to, for, for folks to think about. 
Um, I know we talked a little bit about where, where surges come from. Uh, it, any other stories that you all have about you know loads turning on and off? Um, examples of, of customers, customers that you might have had that um, you can give some unique uh, perspective on. They didn't know this, and then this you know improved their business by X or something like that. Any any cases of that? So um, <clears throat> you know the slide you have up there, you know sixty to eighty percent surges uh, caused internally. Wh which it's actually higher. It's probably at the higher end of that range, right, so at the 80%. Um, you know, the internal sources, we kind of went over through those, you know, load switching, uh, motors turning on and off, external sources with the lightning, power, utilities clicking on and off. There was a, uh, a study done, actually several decades ago, back in the, back in the 70s, by Allen and Segal, those, those are the last names of these two researchers at IBM. Mm -hmm. And what they did, they set out, now at the time IBM's getting into mainframes, right? So th they have a lot of this expensive equipment, big equipment, all over the country. So they set up a research study in 200 facilities across 25 cities. And they did this for two years. And the results came back that 50% of the surges incurred in these facilities was from internal sources. So the things we just identified, motors, lighting, um, switch gear, maybe fans and, and so forth, air conditioning systems. 40% was from external, which, you know, we would say lightning. So they were kind of putting it in that bucket, 40%. Uh, 10% uh, was only from the power grid. So, you know, the, the utilities companies were pretty clean. They were, they were delivering the power consistently. But at the end of the entire research study, 88% 88% of the damaged equipment was a result from just transients, hmm. right? The other 11% was from a uh, power source or, or utility related, okay? So something happened. That was, uh, you know, a tremendous, no one had ever done a study to that extent before. And now there's there's even better studies, right? So, so I, yeah. I know you know of several. And there's, hmm. there's a lot of work now to try to uh, really uh, revisit some of these studies that have been done. Uh, there's better monitoring equipment available now than there were a few decades ago. Sure. And um, so IEEE, EPRI, NEMA uh, are all looking at trying to uh, engage with government agencies and academics to do some more comprehensive studies because to update these things, uh, you look, we have the smart grid, smart cities, smart buildings, smart homes. Yeah. All of the smart electronics are much more susceptible uh, so um, it, the occurrences are just a magnitude or two higher than what they were when, when these initial studies were conducted. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's something to keep in mind because of the sensitivity of these electronics. We kind of talk about three Ds, and there's the, the dissipative effects, the disruptive effects, and then the destructive of effects. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the destructive effects are typically lightning-induced types of surges. But the dissipative effects are kind of chipping away literally at the chips, the semiconductors, they're breaking down insulation and you're not getting the life expectancy out of that equipment mm -hmm. that you should be expecting. It's shortening the life of your equipment, whether that be home entertainment systems or factory automation equipment and everything in between. And the disruptive effects, like what uh, Mike had uh, mentioned in his example with the relay, that's a disruption oh, yeah. that occurred. So there's the dissipative effects to shorten the life, there's the disruptive effects which affect productivity, and, uh, and the destructive effects where you immediately can just lose your equipment, so. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of us, you know, take it for granted, um, you know, having everything work, it, I, I liken it to, you know, when you're, when you're uh, the power side of things, when you're, you're like it to, to, when you're in the airport looking for, everybody's looking for the um, uh, outlet, yeah. you know, charge your phone. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we've, we're in a stage where everything is now communicating with something else. And I think that mm -hmm. we, I, I equate this to the new, the next generation's only gonna know my Wi-Fi is down and I can't tell you how many time, times my kids complain about that. But if, if our workplace and our, you know, home, base is so tight around this communication and everything working. You lose power, you lose communication, and now these things aren't talking to each other. It creates a whole other set of problems. Um, and and the applications, I think, are of energization across the board are going to start to cause some problems where people are going to really realize they can't communicate, something can't communicate with something else. And it's just a trickle-down effect of just 
quality of life, frankly, quality mm -hmm. of work life. Um, I think it's just something we gotta, th we gotta think about. So uh, let me uh, ask you too, uh, you know, we, got a, we did a recent ESFI survey and we found some other, sh other previous uh, research that was done. What isn't a surge? I think that's, that's one of the things we were surprised about in our survey that we found that a lot of people didn't understand what a surge was and then what could possibly affect and or, um, you know, kind of qualify as a surge versus something else. Do you have any stories right. about that or some background? Mm -hmm. Well, well, uh, this, th we have a slide that's actually based on uh, an IEEE standard uh, that goes into interactions between surge protective devices and the power systems. And obviously a, a SAG is not a surge. Interpret a SAG as a temporary brownout type of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an undervoltage. Uh, that's certainly not a surge, a SAG, a brownout. Uh, voltage swells, however, Transients, mind you, are, are in the microsecond domain. And a swell is something that's much more steady state. It could be there for milliseconds, it could be there for seconds. It could be there a lot longer, for minutes or uh, even longer. And um, a temporary overvoltage is very similar, but uh, maybe not quite uh, as long of a duration necessarily, but it's, um, it's still a steady state condition. And what we're trying to convey in uh, this, this particular graphic is the fact that uh, most SPDs, they do a great job of handling thousands of volts in microseconds. If you double the line voltage and you put 240 volts there for a second or two, you could actually damage the SPD because it's conducting constantly. It doesn't know when to stop conducting until the point of no return. So in other words, the, the whole function of the SPD is to go from a very, very high resistance state, almost an open circuit. It's not there, it's invisible under normal situation. Uh, when it sees that transient, the resistance drops incredibly fast and creates that low resistance path, the least resistance path to ground, diverted away, away from the electronic equipment. And um, when, when we see these occurrences of over voltages, the SPDs have to be designed to be able to tolerate that mm -hmm. and not go into a, a catastrophic failure mode. So UL addresses a lot of these scenarios and that UL is a safety standard that, mm -hmm. that, that anticipates the various ways that an SPD can handle an over voltage. And if it does fail, it'll fail safely. There are um, thermally protected uh, varistors out there in the market, varistor being a variable resistor. And that, that's kind of one of the main um, ingredients that goes into an SPD mm -hmm. is the uh, metal oxide varistors. So they, they have thermally protected versions of that that can anticipate uh, that type of scenario. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and let me just add, uh, for on this slide we're talking about um, swells, you know, voltage going higher for a period of time. So, you know, it's important that our viewers understand that, you know, your, your electronics, they go through UL testing. There is a resiliency in that equipment already, right, to over voltages. By uh, some standards, they look at about double the voltage they, these equip for short periods of time now. So say it's a 12 volt uh, security panel. If it sees 24 volts for a short period of time, it'll probably be fine. Right? But if it starts seeing these hits and hits and hits and hits and maybe an over voltage for a longer period of time, yes, you could burn out the electronics or the main control board. So once again, our, 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 our electronics aren't so, so sensitive that they're going to fail at the, the, the first you know, over voltage or, or swell. But you start going two and three and four times the, the rated voltage of the device, yeah, you're going to blow it up. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think you know too. Some of the the, the stories that I've heard is is uh, a lot of times the reason why surge doesn't work is because the installation was not correct. It, you know, every every point. situation mm -hmm. is unique, just like every home is unique, every business setup is unique, and you got to have a, a you know a contractor that really understands surge protection, where it's placed, um, how far it's placed, and 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 many times. The stories that I've heard, it's because something wasn't installed correctly, you know, too far away across the and, room. And, and selecting the correct component. Yeah. And right? I, I, I think it's the right ratings on that device for that application. And it really comes down to really understanding the system that you're working on, installing the right thing, understanding 
the use of the equipment as well, I think would help as well. So right. I think it's one of those things where you really need to have somebody that's qualified that works with you designing the systems, but then also installing the systems. And then, you know, from there, you should be in pretty good shape. But many mm -hmm. times it's, it's an existing, like so SPDs do their job only if they're installed correctly. And I think a lot of folks, um, you know, take for granted either what an SPD is gonna do, um, but if it's not installed correctly, it's not gonna do what it's designed to do. Right. Yeah, so. most manufacturers will have some guidance provided for the panel mount type of SPDs out there. And there's, there's some simple pointers that are provided is the way keeping lead lengths as short as possible, protecting the equipment um, at that point of use. Uh, but one other thing that comes to mind as far as installation and maintenance goes, um, occurred a couple of times over the decades where I've run into situations where there's been SPDs pretty much pretty far damaged, <laughs> let's mm -hmm. put it that way. What happened was they were commissioning a commercial office building, mm -hmm. they were commissioning a project, and um, as we had mentioned, an SPD is not there for a steady state voltage over voltage. It's there for its transients, very, very short microsecond duration. Um, you'll see in commissioning switch gear in a commercial building, they may do some what they call mega testing or high resistance installation dielectric withstand testing. They're putting like 1500 volts steady state on that for up to like a minute. Well, most SPD manufacturers in their installation guidance, one of the first things you'll see is don't do that yeah. <laughs> because it will drive the MOV to fail, uh, the SPD to fail. So there's usually some type of disconnect and hit that off and everything's good. They can check the busway for, for dielectric withstand, but but uh, again, installation guidance is um, very critical as far as best performance goes and just kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and you'll see it right there in some simple uh, installation instructions that come with the you know, manufacturer's uh, SPDs. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, we talked a lot about you know, why SPDs are important. Um, can you all, you know, relay any stories that may, might give us a little more context around, um, you know, what you've seen in the field? I think, you know, everybody's lo looking to try to reduce downtime and figure out what we can do to, to right. improve efficiency and that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, where we are now, um, if you've got downtime and it has to do with equipment, one of the biggest concerns you have is, can I even get that piece of equipment now with supply chain shortages that we have or constraints? Right. And so it, it's really, you know, hopefully raising the awareness to the point where if we can prevent this from even happening, we don't have to worry about those other issues. Uh, that we know that sometimes you can't, you know, get around. Uh, if you're missing a, comp a particular component, um, it, it's a very, the market has changed, and I think that SPDs might be a way for us to really uh, circumvent some of the problems that we're seeing in the marketplace, especially with these sensitive electronics. Yeah. Any stories you all can relay on that? Yeah. So let me let me jump on that one. So you know, at, on the slide that's up, it goes through um, some statistics up there. Um, that lower left, you, these. It, it's funny how people always after the fact. Oh, now I need to put in surge, right? They don't do it ahead of time, kind of proactively, right? So a customer of mine <clears throat> was finishing up a project, and once again, it was a fire detection system in a commercial building, and they were about two weeks away from certificate of occupancy. So getting their CO, signing off, like the owner owns it, right? They had a big storm come through, and it was lightning, so this was an external situation. It blew out not only the fire alarm equipment over that, uh, that uh, storm, but other equipment. So access control, cameras, um, lighting systems in this facility. Who owns those, those losses? The contractors own those losses, hmm. right? It is not turned over yet. Then they had difficulties getting the equipment, install it, retest the system to have it comply with the AHJ requirements, which is code requirements. So all of these things, after the fact, right, I got with them and they, they said, you know what? we're gonna put a surge protection package on every fire alarm system as we do. Now code requires them to do certain amount of surge, right? But now they're gonna protect everything. Mm -hmm. So for the extra five or $600, there's that insurance policy, right? They're gonna, they put it in on every job. Whether it was in the specification, 
not in the specification. And then also to the owner, think about the owner that sees that. They, they, they feel reassured that now they have, on a life safety system, they have the type of protection that'll help that system not go down in the, the most unopportune moment, right? And then get the, get the life cycle out of that system without it degrading before it, it should. Mm -hmm. So that was. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the points I really wanted to draw, uh, you know, people might ask, why is why does the, the foundation necessarily look at this as a safety, um, you know, concern? And I mentioned, you know, the keeping people out of harm's way because of you know not having to, to go in and troubleshoot things and things like that. But really, what it comes down to is life safety. So your your exit signage, your lighting, um, your fire controls, your uh, fire monitoring, and all that kind of stuff. Your security, all that stuff you know, talks to each other and plays a, a vital role with communicating with yeah. something to say, hey, look, something's wrong or something's not wrong. Uh, and to one of your earlier uh, stories, the fact that, you know, it'll it'll notify you when something is wrong. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of times people just act like this stuff can just be plug and play and it's done. There is some maintenance and operations that need to be do, done with this. You need to make sure people understand what this light means. And if you see this light, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you, as, as a homeowner, there's many times where I, I, in a new home, I don't know what that light means. And so, yeah. um, so it's it's really just going through communicating with the the manufacturers that you work with, um, the contractors that you work with, to make sure that your staff is up to speed on what kind of systems they have in uh, their operations and what they you know what certain lights and what alarms mean and that kind of stuff. So you know what's working and what's not working because uh, when things go bad they can go bad pretty quickly and they can cascade so it's just something that, something I thought I'd add any, any yeah. stories that you have well what I found uh, just a few years ago working with a municipal transportation um, they have security cameras on the platforms for the trains and um, actually it was a lightning occurrence that came through after a storm mm -hmm. and uh, the facility engineer was like I had surge protectors what the heck happened and went in and said, well, I don't know, you didn't really cover all your bases. I think most people just look at power, AC power. Sure. Well, all the security cameras now have gone from little BNC connectors for CCTV, now they're using PoE for power over ethernet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those ports also are very susceptible, especially in an outdoor location on a platform for waiting for right. a train. So yeah, he did have, uh, his power supply did get protected but all the video feeds got blasted. Mm -hmm. So he said, oh, I didn't realize I gotta cover, yeah, you gotta cover both your bases on the power and in communication. So signal and data ports need to be protected, not all the time, but in many, many applications, you're gonna make sure there's no back doors where it's feeding through your uh, communication lines. So uh, that, was, that was something that uh, was enlightening <laughs> for, for the engineer, and uh, but but over the years, just walking through uh, with facility engineers, plant engineering people, um, they can usually look at a preventative maintenance program that includes surge protection, and it's easy to justify the return on investment of a SPD. When you look at okay, well, forget about the loss in the equipment mm -hmm. if that gets destroyed. What's the losses in productivity? Yeah. If yeah. I have a system where a bunch of people are sitting in, in, in cubicles but no terminals to work on, productivity goes down. Same goes for a production line. Mm -hmm. if that goes down in productivity. But then also the revenue losses because they're dependent on these systems and they're chugging out either automated factory product lines or chugging out their widgets or mm -hmm. they're billing in an investment banking firm. You know, so it's a combination of the protecting the equipment, pr productivity, maximizing it, and the revenue that is dependent mm -hmm. on that equipment. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, the return on investment is pretty, pretty attractive uh, when you engage with the plant uh, engineering people. Especially, you know, you can you can have the story for not only the C-suite, the the you know, but you have also the managers and you have the workers that can kind of I think you know, all have a piece of, of a return on investment and to keep people safe at the same time, it just makes a lot of sense when you think it, think, mm -hmm. think ahead. Well, yeah, the code requirement is the icing on the cake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. absolutely. So why is protecting from transient so important today? I mean, I, I think we've touched on it a couple different ways, but anything that, that comes to mind in terms of, you know, 
the stories and, and examples that you have, I, th I think those are those are really what we're trying to get across today to say, hey, look, we've 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 ha seen this in the field. This is how it can relate to you, uh, no matter what business you're in or, or or situation you might be in. Anything on those? I think it just makes makes your business, no matter what it is, more efficient. You maximize your productivity and. Um, on the residential level, it's just um, what goes into a home today uh, in, in the present generation is just loaded with smart devices, all of the equipment that's being used in home entertainment, home office. Right now, we've gone through something in the past couple of years where people are either working remotely or in at least a hybrid situation. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of the day, if you're on a uh, Teams call and all of a sudden you black out and your colleagues are wondering, hey, what happened? You gotta explain, oh man, I should have I should have invested in that surge protector and mm -hmm. my boss wouldn't be uh, annoyed that <laughs> our, our conference went down. But uh, yeah. It, yeah. Sure, there's, there's all kinds of applications. Yeah. Um, so how do surges affect uh, the industrial and commercial setting? I know we've touched on it, uh, you know, because our stories kind of do touch on that, but um, anything that comes to mind in terms of, you know, we've got on the screen right now, yeah. mission critical, mm -hmm. code compliance, I mean, those, those are really big talking points, but how does surge kind of fit into those, those talking points and, and any examples that you have of those? So some of the, some of the recent things, codes have changed and try to, get ahead of, say, industries or commercial applications where owners, maybe even sometimes engineers, are a little bit behind the curve and saying, hey, you know what, we need to put some type of surge protection to cover these critical systems. Um, you know, on the screen, we, we, we could be looking at, you know, mission, mission critical equipment could be in a hospital, for example. For the most part, they're probably covering some of that, that equipment. Um, I know in NFPA 72, in the most recent edition, which is the 2021 uh, cycle, um, they've actually enhanced the surge protection testing, and now there's recommendations for replacement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's a uh, mission critical or just standard operating equipment, the life safety industry has recognized that, look at, you, so we do the job, we put it in, then what, <laughs> right? Do you forget about it? Do you not test it? We test, we should be testing everything, right? There is schedules to test many things. Mm -hmm. That wasn't on there, right? We always tested the generators, we test on batteries, right? We make sure these backup systems work. What about the surge? So now that is in there. So, you know, the cycles could be five years, right? This The, the device is in there, it's working, silently, we don't know it's turning on and off, on and off all the time, thousands of times potentially a day. Now there's ways to actually test it. There are tools to test it to see if these devices are meeting their specific electrical parameters and you can replace it. Once again, these are not expensive components. You can change them out, put a brand new device in, it's fresh, it's clean, go. So that's that's something that I'm, I'm seeing more and more uh, now. It, one thing on the maintenance and operations side, it kind of, it kind of uh, drew me back to something, it's it's who's responsible for testing it, right? So so who's responsible to making sure that light isn't on and I know that that light means this, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, <clears throat> some of the previous discussions I've had on SPDs, it's is it the contractor's responsibility? Well, how often is the contractor in your facility? Is, is it your kind of maintenance and operations, you know, building manager, if you will, that would be able to say, oh, that light shouldn't be on, I need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so who's ultimately responsible for kind of monitoring this? And I yeah. think it, that's a lot of, you know, when something goes wrong, you're doing a lot of this. Like, I thought he had it, or I thought she had it. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that there needs to be a plan of action. The maintenance and operation does come in, uh, uh, into play with some of these, you know, higher tech kind of technologies that we're bringing online and surge protection just a piece of that that system that comes online. Um, anything else you want to add to some of those yeah, points? Yeah, it's typically the plant maintenance um, engineering, but what I had mentioned earlier about commissioning. Um, every, every so many years, larger commercial buildings will have a service company come in mm -hmm. to do literally cleanup. They'll go in, clean up their switch gear, and they'll have protocols written in many, many, many times. Um, they don't have surge protection included in there. 
And that's when certain times bad things can happen because they, they simply would only have to look and see if there's a green light on that mm -hmm. panel board because it's not rocket science. Usually it's just a matter of a status indicator, but it's left out. So it's something that you know, we've made, uh, and other companies have made an effort to reach out went to the, the plant engineering, maintenance engineering, people mm -hmm. in commercial industrial buildings. Um, the hospitals, uh, healthcare facilities are much more advanced. One reason that we see it is in uh, backup generators. Mm -hmm. They typically do a one month every month they, they, they test their backup generators, and you look at that transfer switch, and uh, it's got a surge protector there. So any one line diagram you'd see for a healthcare facility where they have their backup generator, there's an ATS automatic transfer switch where you'll see uh, an SPD block drawn right in there next to it. So uh, that stands out. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, I, you know, during COVID, I think, you know, redefining what, what uh, mission critical is. Yeah, it, it's going to be different for everybody, and and you know you need to ask your C-suite probably what is mission critical for you, um, and and search protection plays a role in that. But if you can identify what systems are important or what they would consider mission critical, that's going to be a whole different uh, answer for many different businesses. And yeah. so I think oh, yeah. you know that mission critical definition. I think you know again it's Wi-Fi mission critical is is your security well, we've, life we've safety? worked with public safety and emergency services groups 911 mm -hmm. call centers and they they make sure they have surge protection and backup power systems in uh, even at a very localized level you yeah. know Brett just recently or just a few minutes ago you talked about who's responsible right so part of understanding that question is through education so things like this get people thinking, man, I'm not even thinking about losing my equipment. I'm thinking, okay, you know, the, I get a flat tire, I gotta go replace the tire, right? <laughs> right, you're not thinking mm -hmm. like, don't, run, don't ride over nails, right? Yeah. So, so don't go on roads or construction sites where there's nails, right? That's ahead of the game. And I think, I think education will help that. And I think SPDs are, you know, going along with the car analogy, it's, it's, they're kind of the seatbelt. You never, you never hope you have to use it, you never have to think about it, but it mm -hmm. is something that it protects you. And I think it, it, it is a comfort in terms of knowing what it means to your business and that mission critical aspect of your business, I think is, is, a, is a pretty pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, and just kind of dawned on me with, with retrofits, you know, kind of talking about the maintenance and operation, it's, it's, you know, who's responsible, but if it's a retrofit, maybe it's not part of the checklist that you mentioned before, right? So it's, it's really easy if you're in a, uh, a hospital setting or, you're, or you, you have the experience with, uh, you know, things go wrong and life safety kind of things. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to, um, you know, retrofits, you got to make sure you're updating your internal documents as well to make sure somebody's looking at that as well. And so those retrofits um, are, I think, a huge opportunity to come in and, and really upgrade and protect systems, but then you need to have somebody watching it at the end of the day. And I just thought I'd yeah. throw that in there because mm -hmm. it, it, it is a different uh, scenario than, than we've been talking about. Um, on the screen, you'll see some uh, different types of surge uh, protection. Can one of you kind of run through what a type one, type two, and type three is? And I know when I first started learning about surge protection, um, I was misinformed to say the least. But I think you know if you can walk walk us through what those different protections do and don't do, I think that would be really important for the folks uh, listening to us today. Yeah. I think that we'll, well, type one. Uh, <coughs> is basically, it's a UL terminology, UL 1449, and uh, type one can actually go ahead of the main disconnect or main breaker. Okay. Uh, type two would be on the load side of that main disconnect or main breaker panel. Quite frankly, it's probably a good idea to always be on the load side. You may have been tested as a type one device, but taking some other safety considerations into play, um, it's for any servicing or replacement of that SPD, it's a good idea to have some type of disconnect mechanism to be able to take it offline. Mm -hmm. um, in a residential setting, in load centers in your home, um, typically they'll take the, the SPD panel and wire it into a dedicated two-pole breaker, and that, that protects the entire bus of all the circuits going out to the house. Uh, there are alternatives where you can actually have an SPD in a two-pole breaker housing, and you just plug it right in there, and it protects, again, all the, the entire bus, so all the circuits feeding downstream are protected at that. So really, to make it real simple, type one is ahead of 
the main breaker. Type 2 is on the load side of the main breaker. Type 3 devices are what we kind of call point of use devices. They could be surge receptacles, the outlets with mm -hmm. surge built in, a little green light to tell you it's, it's on, or surge strips, plug-in devices. And um, you'll see some of those types of um, surge strips may have ports for uh, other communication ports on there uh, as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah, USB, USB cable and those kind of things. And I think you know most of us in the in the you know home environment, the consumer environment, are familiar with Type Three because uh, they're they're tangible, they're in front of you, that type of thing. Um, but I think you know a lot of folks, you know, once we get into some of the home stuff coming up, mm -hmm. I think it'll kind of really open your eyes to what opportunities there are to protect you at home. And all of us have a home life. Let's not act like <laughs> this is all business. Yeah. So now more than true. ever, uh, that's yeah. true. Because we're working at part of that home life <laughs> at yep. the that's same time. We're multitasking. Ab absolutely. And and on the screen, you've got some um, examples of some commercial. Uh, things that you're you're protecting and not protecting. Can you all run through those real quick and and make sure that everybody's on the same page there? Yeah, yeah. So the the commercial and the industrial sides. <laughs> so, um, you know, once again on, on the commercial side, you're going to have the systems, right? Your lighting, your life safety, you mentioned exit lighting, and so forth and so on. Um, you know, on the industrial side, you have PLC controllers, you have mic you know a microprocessor based uh, machinery, right? Might be in a in a in a chip manufacturing facility. You know, God forbid those those processes start, you cannot shut them down, right? That's that's probably tens of millions of dollars of, of loss. Um, now, one one thing we and I, and on this slide specifically that that I reminds me of a of a situation. So whether it's commercial or industrial, right? And we have the surge protection in place. We have it pro proper. We had a situation on a, a project where another trade, an electric electrician came in, was doing some work within the building, and it inadvertently connected some high voltage onto some low voltage wiring hmm. of the li life safety system. That mistake completely destroyed the fire alarm system, hmm. right? There was a component of that system which Space Age <clears throat> provides. And we know how critical this is, right? Because these are life safety. So we want to make sure that we, we're providing products that it has the utmost resilience because we know this happens. <laughs> and these things are hard. We, like we make them, they're custom. So they take a long time to make. So we know, like, let's not, let's put a surge protector in there. We do. That device stopped that 120 volt feed from destroying the piece of equipment we made. Everything else got destroyed, right? But think about that. That's inside the building. Somebody makes a mistake, right? Not intentional, just a mistake. And the surge, so the, the voltage is, is on the wire inside the building going like that. It stopped here because we had the, the piece of protection. It didn't stop anything here. And that layered approach when we talked about the SP uh, type one, type two, and then ultimately type three was kind of point of use. If you, you got to think about that wire, right? That conductor. Wherever that surge drops in, it's going in both directions. So just because I had a surge over here like we did and it protected everything on that side of it, everything over here didn't get protected. So you do have to do this layering approach. Is it outside the building from lightning? Is it inside the building? Is it between equipment that could be damaged? So now you're trying to really slice it up and protect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it, it is a system approach, absolutely. And in Mike's example of the 24 volts, all of a sudden seeing 120 volt power lines, um, when we talk about communication lines, signal data protection, um, UL not only has UL 1449 for power, but it also has 497B. And part of that uh, is a power cross. They do a power cross scenario so that if that happens on your low voltage, you get power on top of it. They require some type of inline fusing to open up, take it offline to prevent any kind of fire or shock hazard downstream. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to mention you, 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 you know, 
there's there's many different uh, producers of surge pr equipment, and some of it can be specialized. Other things are a little more mundane, I would say. Yeah. Uh, mm. But there's different applications for everything. Much like there's different applications for your unique situation, there are different surge protection devices that are made to meet those applications as well. And so there's a myriad of, of manufacturers mm -hmm. that are in this mm -hmm. space that can provide something that will probably meet your needs. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, is often taken for granted, we know this because we're on the, the manufacturing side of things and we see it, um, but you all are a wealth of knowledge, not just on this webinar, but also in, in your individual companies. I mean, I think that everybody would be willing to talk through and uh, you know, troubleshoot or, or tell you what solutions might be available. And I think it's something that, that contractors, um, on the you know, contractors, consumers, um, business owners can reach out to those contacts that they have, and, and you all are a wealth of knowledge in terms of understanding what, what's out there and what's available. So I think it's important to mention. Mm -hmm. um, I know we talked primarily about commercial, and I'm sure that's the majority of folks that are, are, are you know, tuning into this program. But on the residential side, again, we all have a home life, um, and it's, to your point, a, a work life now sometimes. Um, how are those affecting the residential buildings? And I think this is all something we can all kind of, you know, kind of work through and realize, I never really thought about my microwave, and I never thought about my new fancy stove that's got this, you know, right. smart component to it. Uh, let alone the smart switches that maybe we're putting in that we want to talk to Alexa and Google and those kind of things. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about um, what SPDs can protect in your home that we all can mm -hmm. relate to um, that maybe we weren't thinking about. Any of you have examples either? Well, I think it, it's interesting that uh, earlier I had mentioned at the load center, um, people can apply an external SPD wired into a dedicated breaker, mm -hmm. but now there are a, a number of um, companies who provide the actual molded case circuit breaker package that has surge protection that can easily be plugged in. Mm -hmm. And so that, that just makes things a lot easier. Um, again, it's just a simple, you're looking for a green light to have peace of mind that yeah. it's still actively protecting all of those circuits feeding out into the home. But uh, again, communication lines as well. Yep. You don't want that back door for a surge to come in and and uh, blow out your, your COM board, Ethernet ports, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of quick things, <laughs> and this is from personal experience. Living in Tampa, Florida, we do have power loss, lightning storms, hurricanes, right? I mean, there's a lot of disruptions that could happen around the domicile. Um, I had a situation just recently where some I think it was squirrels or some rodents had gotten into the outside air conditioner and were flossing their teeth on the insulation of, of some 24 volt AC wiring, right? That goes to my thermostat inside the house. It shorted out the thermostat, right? Now, surge protection isn't gonna, isn't gonna prevent that, right? I, I mean, they're chewing on these wires, they shorted it out, it damaged the component in there, but I was without air conditioning um, a couple of months back and you know, you got to wait till you get that fixed, right? Yep. Um, also, being prepared for hurricanes, and I made sure that my family is protected and prepared. Um, I have a generator, backup generator with a transfer switch. Generators are, th and the type of generator I'm using, there's good generators you could spend thousands of dollars on, and there's just general use generators. Well, this one has very dirty power, and for those of you that might use UPSs, your uninterruptible power supplies on your computers, they don't like generators, right? So uh, one of the hurricanes, I was out power for a week and I was finding my UPS would drop out, drop out, drop out. It would not stay on on the generator. It's because the generator does not generate the, a nice, clean, pure sine wave, 120 volts coming into the house and the UPS doesn't recognize it. So there's other things that can be done, not only the transient protection, because I want to make sure I clean up as much of the dirty uh, uh, transients that are coming on the line. But also, uh, uh, there's the thing called a line conditioner. And the line conditioner actually kind of kind of takes the, the dirtiness of the, of the generator and cleans it up a little bit on the output side, mm -hmm. right, through a transformer that's inside the case, and the UPS works. So there's things that, cus that, that people could do in their, in their home because I wanted to stay, you know, operational. I could get my, my uh, internet was up. Right, so I had to get power, but I had to get my computers running. My computers were plugged into the UPS, but the UPS wasn't working. Sure. So, so these are these are some things that um, you know, a little research people could fi could figure out. The, the other things, you know, we got a lot of pools in Florida, so those 
pool controllers that control the pump and all your special mm -hmm. features, those are sensitive too. Yeah. Um, and they're typically out by the pool equipment, so that's kind of like on the outside of the building. So once again, having some transient protection on those systems, making sure that the contractors are putting that there could just eliminate any large expenses of losing you know, that nice control system that, that you want to have for your own. Yeah. Well, well, HVAC units is uh, actually twofold because if you put the SPD at the disconnect switch for the HVAC compressor, you're not just protecting that, but when that kicks in, that could be yeah. injecting a surge back into That's your right. house. So it's kind of covering both your bases. It's kind of a surge generator in itself, but it's also susceptible possibly right. to getting damaged. So yeah. that SPD at the disconnect switch, uh, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. <laughs> those applications are, are definitely you know something to think about. And you know on the screen we've got heating and air conditioning, which we mentioned before, washers and dryers. I've, you know, the smarter and smarter that they get, they're susceptible to anything. Uh, water heaters, uh, just think about in your kitchen. I mean, if you've read, oh, read yeah. on your, your kitchen between the, the microwave, the stove, the refrigerator that now might have a screen on it, um, you know, all those are, are sensitive, they have sensitive electronics in them, and you could, if you lo lose those, you can't really point to somebody else to say it's your fault yeah. or your problem. Right. So Anything with a digital display on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. They have, they've got a brain in them. And, right. then, and then yeah. lighting and entertainment systems. I think anybody that's in the audiophile world, I think, um, you know, some of us that have dabbled in that realize that power is an important thing, um, but then also the, the cleanliness of power, as you mentioned before, yeah. um, but also, you know, we, we're used to the point of use protecting, you know, the, the stuff that we can see, but, you know, we don't realize maybe what could be coming in the back door, and I think that's very important to, mm -hmm. to reference. Um, and on the screen, uh, we've got, uh, I think that the average is about 15,000 or so of potential damaged equipment that could come from, um, you know, a surge, and so it's probably more than that, if you've got some expensive stuff in your home, and oh, yeah. it, it's one thing to kind of kind of say, when should those be replaced? Uh, at the foundation, we always recommend, you know, make sure you're buying the right thing. Make sure it has surge protection, not just a power strip. So it's not just providing extra outlets, but actually provide some some protection. But don't also, um, you know update that stuff as needed too. You can't use these things forever. Make sure it actually is working. It's kind of yeah. peace of mind, especially for yeah. computers and, and big and, electronics. And just to maybe put the cherry on top of this, so having that degree in electronic engineering, I fix a lot of things. I get eight out of 10 times that damaged electronics, it's the power supply. Hmm. It's the power supply. You're, you're, you're blowing a chip, you're popping a, a a voltage converter, it's the power supply. I've fixed many things in my home, get extra time out of my microwaves, out of TVs, and it's always, it always, majority of the time, it's the power supply. It's right at the front end, and what, what's coming in there? Surges. Yeah. Yep. The, other, the other comment I would make on residential in this new generation world we live in is uh, EV charging stations. Mm. If you have an EV charging station in your garage, um, you're gonna wanna protect uh, have surge protection applied there. There's actually, uh, not to get too detailed, but IEEE just uh, next year will be publishing a mm. EV SPD standard okay. uh, for applications. And likewise for PV, if uh, you have PV panels on your home at the inverter and energy storage units, mm. you should be applying surge protection there. Yeah, technology is not yeah. stopping, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times the codes themselves are a little bit lagging. Um, and so when you're d introducing this new technology, it's important that you're protecting it and talk about a big investment. Uh, you can't yeah. get much bigger than that. So yeah, electric right. vehicles yeah. and photovoltaics are something to think about. Um, we talked about one, two, and three already before, but this is just another breakdown of what the National Electro Code uh, requirements mm -hmm. are. Um, and those have changed recently. Any, any, I think we touched most of those points. Um, yeah in terms of what the code is actually requiring. Can you all go through that just really quickly to make sure everybody understands on our home side that we're protected as well? Any, any stories? Well, 2020 was yeah. a, a, a high impact uh, article uh, 230.67 uh, for residential dwellings. And um, something to keep in mind there is that even though say GFCIs or AFCIs, ground fault protectors, arc fault protectors, they, they go through UL with some very minimal, nominal amount of actual surge testing, mm -hmm. but nowhere on the level of what a surge protector would be tested for. And it, because it is such a very basic, minimal amount of surge protection, you do want to have that added higher level of surge protection just for those because they are directly 
relate it to life and fire. Uh, so I think that was part of what they had in mind when they introduced 230.67 yeah. for residential dwellings uh, to homes. Um, the 2023 will actually be introducing uh, requirements for feeders, which affects dormitories and assisted living facilities, right. things along those lines. Right. But, uh, <coughs> so down in Florida, to this to this point, the code changes. So Tico, which is my uh, power provider, they have uh, what's called a zap cap, and they have been offering that for over 10 years. Now, residents, re new residentials, requiring to have that type one. So a type, this is a zap cap. It's type one. It's coming into the home. It's typically 240 volts coming into the home, 200 amp service, and then it you know breaks down and branches to the home. But they offer that, so they they actually install that, and it's monitored by them. So they could see if it's malfunctioning, and it works. I mean, you, you do pay for it on a, as a service because it's it's included in the bill. But you know, to the point, um, <laughs> good investment, right? Yeah. Especially in areas that have a lot of lightning strikes, because that is external, right? Um, we're talking internal in a lot of cases, but that is external. You could do your internal later with the mm -hmm. type twos and type threes. Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, can you kind of tell me about the, like, I, I know we've talked about the different tiers, but those tiers do work together. Can you tell me about, you know, how those tiers and different SPDs can work together to protect you holistically versus just piece by piece? Yeah, I, I, well, I think part of the discussion on residential covered much of that, but in the commercial industrial environment, which is much more complex. Um, most engineering firms will have one-line diagrams that shows the whole electrical layout, and they can really identify from the service entrance to distribution panels to mm -hmm. all the way to lighting panels where where um, this should be applied, the SPD should be applied. So you'll in those one-line diagrams, you'll see a, a lot of little SPD squares drawn in mm -hmm. on those critical areas. So whether it's uh, Elevators, escalator controls, uh, fire, life safety type controls, mm -hmm. uh, right on down through, um, whether it's code mandated or not, it, it's going to tie into what's equipment that's really needed to keep keep the plant or business up and running at the end of the day. Sure. And um, we've even seen a, a, a new code requirement actually in industrial uh, for uh, industrial machinery safety interlocks and that carried through to another NFP standard, uh, 79, NFPA 79, but uh, safety interlocks need surge protection on NEC and uh, NFPA 79. So really, um, that cascading approach is gonna, you know, any brute force SPD, higher surge current rating as your first line of defense for external surges right. up front, and then as you work your way downstream to lighting panels and such, um, but it, it's, certainly uh, a very strategic way to kind of look at the layout of your facility and, and apply surge where it's really warranted, mm -hmm. yeah. which is more or less most places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. and as yeah. the slide kind of shows from left to right where it's a high amplitude on the left and then kind of a smaller waveform on the right, but also understand that could happen anywhere within the middle of that, right? So that transient, that's why the arrows go both ways, right? They're kind of showing that it could, it could hit here. So if you have protection on both sides, like I use the example of, you know, inside the building, the contractor miswiring something, <clears throat> that could happen in your house too, right? Yeah. Um, something short out, uh, an appliance, who knows, arcs, draws current, so forth. So, so that layering approach, I mean, works. Yeah, especially when we know that, again, not to drive this point home, but to drive the point home, 60, 80% <laughs> of the time, time it's in the building. Yeah, it's um, And that's, that I think is, is something that's a big takeaway. Yeah, years ago we had a surge monitoring in an office environment and uh, had it placed right near pretty heavy duty printer, laser printer, and uh, it was counting low level, fairly low level surges, but nonstop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that area they had a little coffee maker and they were buying a new coffee maker like every other month because really? <laughs> it kept zapping the thing yeah. and uh, it wore it down. So yeah. that was one of those yeah. Ds for the dissipative effects uh, wow. on, on that appliance. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I think, you know, sometimes you get to the point where you just assume that something is going to break. And I think a lot of times you, 
that assumption is not correct. If it's not where if it's wearing out prematurely, there's a reason behind it. And to your point, I think power surges could have a big part in that, especially for sensitive mm -hmm. electronics and even something as simple as a coffee maker. Uh, you know, if it doesn't make sense why it's not working correctly or not having the life that you expect, I would look at your power condition and figure out what's going on on that, you know, supply side to figure out if there's something going on there because it's not acceptable in business to be, you know, replacing something that shouldn't need to be replaced. There's a reason why okay. that's failing. So let's investigate that a little bit further and see if you can, number one, mitigate the downtime. Number two, mitigate the person have to go in there and fix it all the time. And then number three, having to find the equipment and the supply chain issues that we have, yeah. the, it's, it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And in replacing those sensitive electronics, yeah, it might be not part of the HVAC system as a whole, but if you need a motherboard or something that's controlling that HVAC unit, finding that, especially for something that's a little bit older, is going to be a problem nowadays. Yeah. And so it's just something you really need to kind of be on top of. And, and power coming in, I think, is, is a real vulnerability to most people that are out there. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, w with the survey that we recently did, uh, there's a lot of things that people assumed prevented um, surges. Can you talk a little bit about the graph that's on the screen? I think, you know, you all in the industry, it's like, wow, we have a lot of work to do to yeah. uh, educate people. But talk about some of the stuff you see on the screen and, and maybe provide some examples if you can. Yeah, I mean, fuses and circuit breakers are for overloads and short circuit current protection. That's certainly not going to do anything when it comes to uh, transients. It's transients is going to yeah. blow right by them. Um, if it's a big enough transient, we've seen cases where they might trip a breaker, but um, they're certainly not going to address transients. A GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupter. That's that's right. certainly not going to do anything for uh, surge protection. So it's it's a misnomer that maybe they think overcurrent protection can take care of transient voltage protection, yeah. but um, certainly totally two different things. Yeah, and once again, longer duration, the, the fuses or circuit breakers, where fuses could blow pretty quickly, but I'll tell you, some of these, some of these fuses they have in big power systems, they're literally copper bars. They're <laughs> they take a while to burn through, mm -hmm. right? So that surge is, is there. It's not a transient. It's a voltage, over voltage. Um, UPSs is up there, and that's that's a good one. The, convi the, the UPSs are designed for giving you backup battery power, right, through an inverter that creates AC to power your computer, your mm -hmm. AC computer. Um, but, no, transients can get through that thing, right? It's That's just a condition that's just a battery charger and then kind of flips on to its inverter to do what it was designed to do and that's to provide ac power when the the main feed goes away mm -hmm. so yeah not does not now some some of them they actually do design that they add some surge protection in the back so you might see that you could run wires in and out of in and out of the connection points on ups's but you're going to pay for that and they're labeled they're mm -hmm. surge protection mm -hmm. so Okay. Power strips, just a reminder that if it is a surge protected power strip, make sure it has that hologram UL label on it, because over many, many years, I've seen some that uh, kind of bypass that, that little technicality of getting it through UL, and when they got undersized components in there claiming to be a surge protector, you end up with a big burn through hole, mm -hmm. and yeah. nobody wants that in their carpeting in the family room. So. Uh, sure for safety reasons that UL uses a hologram, UL listing label on those uh, surge strips. Uh, a lot of counterfeit type product that gets out into the marketplace on that. Sure. It's just not safe. Yeah, know what you're buying, understand it's intended use, but make sure it's providing what you think it's providing. I think it's, you know, don't go always go with the cheapest thing, understand what you're, yeah, what you're right. actually a signing A safe up surge for. protector. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you all tell us, you know, SPDs versus uh, surge arresters, um, what's the difference protection-wise, you know, yeah. can you tell me a little bit more yeah, about that? Yeah, so, and that kind of springboards off of the previous slide of what's not a surge protector, right? So arresters, surge arresters are not uh, transient mm -hmm. suppressors or uh, surge protection devices. These are typically used in a thousand volts or more applications. Uh, typically it's at the power generation side of, uh, of equipment. So big step down transformers or a transformer field, uh, mostly designed to channel away lightning or um, high voltage 
uh, spikes created maybe by a, a, an equipment malfunction, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so think of that's kind of on the power generation side where the surge protection devices <clears throat> And, and, on, and on the uh, the arrestor, there it's it's kind of like a wider voltage window, right? A lot more gets through on this side, but we're also talking tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand volts. Mm. On the surge protection uh, side, you know, much more targeted. It's it's a thousand volts or or less. Many cases, you know, much less. 120 volts, 24 volts, 12 volts, some small small DC voltages. And then these are um, this on the surge protection side they're more finely tuned to direct application for whatever that whatever that voltage is. Um, some may have some additional features, remote monitoring, you can kind of see indications that whether it's working or not working. So those are the those are probably the stark dis, uh, differences. The high voltage, thousand plus, low voltage side surge protection devices. These are these are targeted at transients, very short duration, mm -hmm. quick. It could be high voltage, it could be high current, right? You could see many thousands of volts spike, but very, very quick. Yeah. So. yeah. All right, I know we you briefly touched on twenty twenty three changes. Um, what do we what do we see coming in the future? Obviously it's not gonna give us everything, but what are what are we uh, seeing in the NEC twenty twenty three? there's two two articles that address um, feeders, which are on the slide, 215.18 and uh, 245, 42. Um, so that, that actually um, is kind of an outgrowth of what they had um, in 230.67 from 2020 code mm -hmm. um, for dwellings, residential dwellings. Um, but it will have an impact, dormitories, um, remote buildings uh, that need feeders that go out on a campus environment. Um, mm -hmm. What's ahead? Uh, I don't know. We'll see what um, you know. The industry at large starts to see. I think. Well, I, I mentioned safety interlocks on the industrial side, mm -hmm. and that's an area of interest to see um, what other areas that may fall into safety concerns with uh, NFPA 79 and the NEC, as far as uh, in in that industrial environment. I think uh, in the commercial realm of things, it's certainly where we're looking at uh, emergency call centers has been addressed, uh, critical operating uh, systems, I think, need to be further defined. A lot of people, when they look at COPS, COPS, uh, they're like, what exactly does that all fall into? Because you can be pretty broad in defining what are critical operations uh, systems. Yeah. And I, I think maybe there needs to be some more definition there because it, it could get a little broad and, and kind of be borderline as far as how that how that is actually addressed to the application I think it yeah. it often it often um, you know gets to a point where it, again it's it's based on your unique situation um, I mentioned before it's it's what's mission critical to you is going to be way different than it is from somebody else um, and that that just comes down to the individual in the business and I think you got to be working with your contractors your uh, manufacturers uh, making sure things are installed correctly I mean it really just kind of goes downstream that you've got, you've got to be working with the right people that really can educate you in terms of what your business needs. But also it means that you need to define what's critical to you versus something that eh, maybe it's not as important. Um, but I think the application of the code, again, a standard is just the, the bare minimum. You can right. go above that code. Um, and SPDs, I think, are one of those really opportunities that you can really protect yourself before and after almost every electrical component that you have. Um, and if there's any possibility, whether it's communication lines or anything else, there's an opportunity there to protect yourself, protect your business, protect your, your home and, and your family too. So, no doubt, no doubt. Okay. Yeah, I don't think the code should be the defining driver because it goes way beyond, if there was no code at all, there's certainly very valid reasons why surge protection right. is completely warranted to protect your business. Uh, uh, yeah, enough said now. Don't yeah. I agree. I think we have, we've touched on a lot of different high points. And again, I think there's a wealth of knowledge, you know, from, from such a matter experts like you all, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that do do this stuff, a lot of contractors that are, you know, are skilled in this. And it, it's, it's really time to reach out to that channel to make sure that uh, you understand uh, as a business owner the opportunities that are out there to protect yourself and your business. Um, with that, I think we'll close everything out. I uh, appreciate everybody uh, uh, attending. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Mike and uh, Matt for being our subject matter experts today. Uh, we will have some uh, follow-up videos and different types of collateral that you all can tap into. 
uh, addition, obviously you can you can reference all the different codes and standards that we spoke about. Uh, but again, I encourage you to, to reach out to your, your contractors, uh, your providers, see what they have to offer, see what kind of questions you can ask them, and then figure out where you go from there. But again, what's critical to you might not be critical to somebody else, but search protection definitely plays a role in that. Uh, so I encourage you to, to look into it further to protect you and, and uh, your business. So with that, we'll sign off and uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, hopefully there'll be some more in the future. Thank you.